get the gist at this point. The Disney's 90s renaissance naturally had a lot of imitators. In fact, there is a trilogy of the most notable theatrical ones. Thumbelina was just not very good. Anastasia was so good that it eventually got absorbed, making 1994's The Swan Princess the literal mid of them. And while it does have the unique angle of the love interests who knew and hated each other as children, only to instantly forget about it the minute they became of age, it's generally pretty derivative. And like most of 90s Disney, it inspired two VHS sequels. And it remained but a wallflower in animation history until 2012 when Streetlight Studios decided to turn it into the next land before time by giving it now eight CGI home sequels. Many of them revolving around Derek and Odette's adoptive child and otherwise just subpar wacky hijinks with the Swan Princess cast. Except unlike in the original trilogy, nobody turns into a swan, so it renders the title a liar. Then in 2023, they released two of these movies serving as a part one and part two, but apparently these are at least the last of these movies. Thank goodness, because you can probably tell what these movies are like just from looking at them. This is some ugly, ugly ass animation for a series that has gone on for a decade. But at least it's ugly in a way that makes it funny. There is a constant chronic case of dead eyes. Anime from the 50s has better lip sync than this. For some reason, one of the things I found the most distracting was Uberta's hair wobbling when it had every excuse to just be fixed in place. But the biggest thing that I find absolutely hilarious, this is supposed to be the king. <laughs> Why is he dressed like a six-year-old playing dress up? And what makes this even funnier, the first of these films is about how Derek's mom, Uberta, and her husband end up becoming the kingdom's monarchs on a bloodline technicality, when initially they were just living alone in the woods. He literally is dressed better as a commoner than he is as a king. And the second movie is about Derek and Odette going undercover as magicians and then as pirates to find out what happened to Derek's father. He just had to know where he got his impeccable dress sense from. And yeah, that plot point goes exactly where you think it does. I'll give the second film that there were a few jokes and even a song that were okay, though you can imagine at this point how far my bar had dropped. And despite myself, I did really like how Derek and Odette were solid partners all throughout that movie. It's embarrassing how often good movies fail to do this. And the first film by nature had a lot of callbacks to the 94 film, and how it deals with the inevitable parental death was somewhat commendable. But at the end of the day, both of these movies are about as atrocious as they look. So I can't pretend I'm sad that we won't be getting any more of these. Though I am mildly curious about the bargain bin Eurovision. You talk about your carols and your Christmas tree, but the best parts of Christmas are all the gifts for me. Ugh, it's so ugly. I cannot believe they're still doing these. I know it's a bit of a low blow coming from somebody who has never been a fan of this franchise, and I do know now that the gimmick of the series is that Greg kinda sucks. But it doesn't make it any more fun to watch. Not even the Christmas sentiment could save this. At least the end keeps his character consistent and doesn't have him become a decent person out of nowhere. I'll acknowledge that there was a joke and a moment that got me, and I did find it more tolerable than the very first of these. Sorry, Dire of a Wimpy Kid fans. I will admit that the live action makes this look way better. I did not account for this. Didn't count on this. I did not account for this. No, oh, oh. Mummies is one of those fantastical creatures in a modern city movies with every expected joke of that variety you can think of. But I am sorry, you cannot do the ancient people react to modern day if you are also doing the ancient society playing like it's modern day with your lame attempt at smartphone stand-ins. You cannot do both. And what are our classic family movie style dilemmas? These two are forcibly engaged, but they don't like each other. And there's an evil businessman who loves to exploit Egyptian relics for his museum. And the Mario movie didn't have this many tone shattering needle drops, though at least this one does provide some of its original music for what that's worth. But you cannot use Nickelback's Far Away as your love ballad. You just can't. For the most part, this is just formulaic, but I will shout out giving this movie an actual cute animal sidekick and the one scene that the musical fan in me at least found amusing, where the two conveniently get wrapped up, 
Ka into an Egyptian-themed musical, but they think that singing is just how this society communicates. So the wannabe singer princess tries to sing her way into obtaining the MacGuffin that they need, and turns the play into a dramatic love triangle. I kind of conceptually love that, even if the execution was predictably cringe. There is definitely a lot worse by animated movie standards. This is very Sherlock Gnomes territory. And Tuck is such a typical Tumblr sexy man design. If this came out a decade ago, people would easily be shipping him with the Onceler. Oh god, what cursed speech have I uttered into existence? Underdog. It's a preschool movie. I don't know what you want from me. No Paw Patrol is not a terrible movie by any extent. It is decently animated. It even has a few solid good jokes. It's given a lot of theatrical polish and now given superpowers, but I can still see where the animation is limited and it's just not that interesting. I'll admit the former mayor seemed like he was an entertaining villain, but given his gimmick, I'm also getting the impression this is one of those series that endorses the blasphemous dogs good, cats bad. So, you know, that's enough for me to blackball this series on principle. And the new supervillain only has the one joke of constantly denying that she's a mad scientist until the end where she says, I guess I am, which is kind of like what watching the entire movie's like. Though I admit those moments with Sky are a little heartfelt, but at the end of the day, this is still a movie for preschoolers in a world where Bluey has set the bar for genuinely enjoying junior entertainment. It's certainly not bad, and it's certainly not annoying, which is definitely something, but at the end, there's not a whole lot more to say. Easily the most amusing thing about this movie's existence was how they tried to recapture the magic of Barbenheimer with Saw Patrol. Because I can't think of a better double feature than a preschool show, followed by the series that mainstreamed torture porn. Though I'm pretty sure that even whoever concocted that knew how blatantly gimmicky it was. No restrictions and no strife just kick back relax and enjoy your afterlife as much as i mourn the lack of animated horror this year i can't be too surprised that the canterville ghost is another family-friendly comedic romp that is not remotely scary as the oscar wilde short story that it's based on is i guess the prototype for every single comedic subversion of the classic ghost story as it's largely told from the ghost's perspective that it wants to scare away the new family that moved into his house only for them to be either mildly put off by the inconvenience or oddly sympathetic to his plight. The short story is already pretty funny with the ghost himself being fooled and intimidated by the pranks of the family's twin boys, only now the goofiness is increased a bit more, though it still holds the essence of sympathy and tragedy from the short story, even with a romantic subplot I didn't entirely hate, and employed with a talented voice cast. And the animation is doing the best with what it has. Oh dear, I seem to have been crushed by a chandelier, but it only mildly threw my back out. Yeah, that's kind of what we're dealing with. But like the ghost itself, you're compelled to feel bad for this film because apparently this movie was first projected to come out 10 years ago. So this is straight to streaming level, but a film can only be so bad when it has a sword fight with death. The short story is honestly way funnier and you can read that online for free. You dream a little harder, you're sure to follow through. There may have been worse films this year, but there really haven't been any other baffling disappointments like Wish. And honestly, it gets more disappointing the more I think about it. It has enough elements to be described as okay but unimpressive like its animation, but where other Disney movies have been more underwhelming, I can't even agree with the weirdly large amount of people who merely call this mid, because this, frankly, is a level of narrative incompetence I wouldn't have thought Disney was capable of. Who puts in seven side characters that do relatively nothing for a reference? Who gives the villain so many sympathetic traits and then does absolutely nothing with them? Who has a welcome to the city opening number where you tell us nothing about the city? Really feels like the core problem is that nobody really decided what this movie was about. It's trapped between wanting to pay too much homage to its past while still constrained by the trappings of modern Disney and trying to be its own thing. However, what still is the most disappointing, that the music is boring and the lyrics are insipid. Then King Magnifico ends up being the thing that gives the movie most of its life, but he is also a cluster of conflicting narrative signals. 
I kind of want to do a whole thing on Magnifico, but considering the likelihood of that adding to the very large list of videos that I start and don't finish, I do want to say something to the crowd of Magnifico is actually the good guy and the fact that he doesn't succumb to all of his citizens' selfish desires is actually what makes him a wise leader. And Aja's a horrible, selfish protagonist for demanding that he grant the wishes without contest. Okay, so that's not what happened. Though I do understand the confusion considering the trailer sells it like that. Asha never demands he needs to grant every wish. It's that he doesn't have a convincing reason, one way or the other, why he doesn't give the other wishes back. Because they are people's missing memories, as well as basically part of their souls. So that becomes the whole plot of the film. It's a heist, a really boring heist, to get the souls back. However, that is what makes this movie's conflict weirdly existential, and why the audience doesn't really know how to feel about it when there isn't an obvious net negative effect. Which is why I am so mad at this deleted scene that apparently solves all of those problems. Why doesn't Magnifico give the wishes back? Because he eats them for power. So it's like what happened in the second half, only it was always the case. Thank you! Simple! Villain! Why was this so hard? There's also weirdly the take of everything would have been fine if Asha had just minded her own business. Actually, Asha does very little of consequence in this movie that's actually part of the problem. Because the one thing that I like about this incarnation of Magnifico's character is that his deterioration into mega cartoonish supervillain is entirely his own fault. He's the one who succumbs to his pettiness and his vanity and his paranoia, all because the citizen stopped kissing his ass for five minutes to ask basic questions. Which I think is very funny and also currently relevant. He's basically every single influencer who finally makes it big. But no, they, they definitely should have stuck with the obvious villain thing. And if you're going to turn this into another Easter egg factory, better yet to do that in a short where you could do that in its purest form. Once Upon a Studio is maybe one of the best things that came out of Disney this year, except for the Owl House finale, and was originally slated to play in front of Wish. Which I guarantee would have given it a little bit more at the box office by itself, and certainly would have made the credits make sense. The decision to not was seemingly to have it release on Plus, exactly on the anniversary, on the platform where the most people would see it. Which I think is admittance that they didn't think this was gonna do very well. This poor Everyone's happy to say that DreamWorks is king and Disney is dead when Puss is in theaters, but nobody went to go see Ruby, did they? I doubt Ruby would have ever been a big moneymaker, but it was definitely not done any favors by having DreamWorks change its release date a matter of two months before its release. Because it at least deserved better than that. It did have a fun, flexible art style, and a memorable antagonist that was already given away that it was an antagonist. But that's very DreamWorks. However, in honesty, Ruby doesn't climb that high into DreamWorks' animated library. Too much of this movie feels like a 2000s-era Disney Channel original movie to me. Very specifically, the 13th year. Admittedly, with much higher production values, but it has all of the high school tropes that you would expect. And there are times where the script feels just completely fractured. Like it is literally duct tape with various drafts, where one scene doesn't even flow into the next scene very well. Easily the best thing is the animation on the Krakens, which is a lot of fun. And there are some good isolated gags. I think Ruby would be appreciated by the right audience that doesn't mind all that high school campy energy, but it is not for me. It is the season of the heart, a special time of caring, the ways of love made clear. Urkel Save Santa was one of the completed films that certain somebody indefinitely shelved and likely planned for a tax write-off. And if only for that reason, I am glad to see it resurrected, and if only to see Andre's response to it. And for any youngin that doesn't know, Steve Urkel is the famous exaggerated nerd character from the 90s show Family Matters. Though in this special, other than a few references, I didn't see any other characters from the Family Matters universe that I remembered. So this is very much a solo expedition where irritating but well-intentioned Stephen Urkel is trying to encourage the Christmas spirit to a town of Grinches and decides the way to do that is to gamify Christmas with a point-based app. 
So there is certainly an amount of tech and modern day commentary here, which might be undesired. But otherwise, I just found this to be a very passable Christmas special. I was glad that it was a musical. I enjoyed the reveal of who Santa really was. As Christmas specials go, this isn't a classic, but I will take it over the Bad Guys Christmas special, which was a massively disappointing animation downgrade. It is a bit more on par with the Boss Baby Christmas special, which I admit I actually kind of liked. I liked how it handled the topic of tradition. When the sleepy planet comes alive and I wake up in the warm sunlight. Mob Cup might be my most precarious placement because it is not only that this is a Ukrainian film, but it has also been in development hell for something like a decade and is based on a very famous and beloved Ukrainian story, comedic anime sweat drop. I'm not positive if there are significant cultural elements that I'm missing. For what I hear, this movie just finally being finished is greatly appreciated, but I've also heard some being disappointed that the animation is so standard CGI. Feel free to tell me if I am completely off the mark about this. Outside of whatever story details this carries over from the original fairy tale, which I do think are potentially interesting, the only thing that I can really credit this film for is some really great fantasy creature designs. But for the most part, it's a pretty standard nature versus human story with an evil businesswoman, and the main romantic duo have all of the chemistry of plywood. And it did have a pretty cool climax that reminded me of the Firebird short from Fantasia 2000. And yes, whatever obvious joke you thought of is probably the top review on Letterboxd. Okay, so first of all, there's like 12 companies in the credits at the start of this film, which is starting to become a lot more common. Inspector Sun, or the Bug Detective, if you're on HBO Max or Amazon, even though that title has technically already been taken, pays homage to the range of mid-century classic detective stories and comedies from Poirot to the Pink Panther. In fact, I doubt it's intentional, but the one he visually reminds me of is Mori Kogoro. <laughs> Inspector Sun is an egotistical, pretentious airhead whose reputation is that he is more lucky than clever. And I thought I recognized the voice of a Daily Show correspondent. And of course, it takes place on a fancy mode of transport where a murder has taken place. Also, he is a spider. And above all, I absolutely love the cartoon insect designs in this film, which takes full advantage to incorporate the traits of various species into their character and even the mystery. Generally, this is still a pretty standard family comedy affair, but anthropomorphic insect film noir? Not a ton of those. When you're staring at the impossible, face to face with the incredible, does it come as a surprise when you just believe your eyes? Magician's Elephant is based on a children's book and it feels like it. And that can be in both a good and a bad way because children's stories are able to embrace a kind of fantastical logic that sometimes even family movies aren't able to do. The crux of the story is that a boy needs to do three impossible things in order to claim ownership of an elephant that he was told he needs to find his sister and finds the technical and linguistic loophole to accomplish each one of them. It's one of those movies where the protagonist's earnest willpower and optimism can come off as Wonka-esque whimsy and inspirational, or irritatingly naive depending on your mood. It does use the word believe a lot, but if nothing else, it does have an old lady getting flattened by an elephant. Road Rally Racers, an Americanized, blanded title for the Silk Road Racers, was a movie I initially waved off assuming that it was just another Paw Patrol. But it definitely isn't. This is a movie whose race scenes remind me so much of the Wachowski's Speed Racer, including having a very funny cartoony villain that is one of the best parts of the movie. I am so glad that that movie is getting appreciation now. I was one of the ones that liked it from the start, but I admit it's because I didn't watch it in theaters. Those visuals can be a lot. And you know what? If you are going to drop Take On Me at a flippin' nowhere, then you might as well go all the way and do the animation too. These kinds of sports stories of a kid who wants to be the best like no one ever was is about as expected as these stories can get, but it makes its protagonist stand out by giving him a very particular hang-up. That he does really well when he's behind, but when he gets in front, he panics because he fixates too much on what's behind him. 
Its script is also fairly grounded in that it doesn't try too hard to push humor where it's not needed, saving that for the cartoon antics of its literal wacky races. So overall, it earned my respect. Which is why I was particularly shocked that this came out of Vanguard Animation, which has historically been known to make garbage. This is easily the best thing they've ever made. Well, I did finally catch up with Miraculous Ladybug this year, which has arguably done the most interesting, compelling thing with its story that it's done in a while, about two years after the bulk of its fanbase has stopped caring, many having aged out of the series or merely having lost trust in the series' ability to fulfill its promise after waiting eight years for it to do anything with the world's most perpetually repetitive, aimless shipping tease in the history of anything. Yeah, I do not blame people for just being done, even for as generally good as I think season 5 was, that finale leaves off on such a WTF moment. This is not the time to be testing your fanbase's patience, this is the time to win them back, which is arguably at least somewhat what its feature movie seemed to kinda do, as it went over very well with its fans and as far as I know had nothing to do with the creator of the series, which has been its own drama. Having gotten so fed up with the show dragging its feet, many were thrilled that the movie finally gave them a lot of what they have been wanting. The animation upgrade, which was undeniably pretty, allowing for the romance between Ladybug and Cat Noir to actually spark something, and even allowing Monarch to be the tortured family man he always secretly was instead of just boasting his usual cartoonish villainy as though that other path doesn't exist. And even then, he got to show it off a bit. As much as you might have thought that the Miraculous movie would have served as an alternative origin story that was already technically made by the show itself, it's actually an alternate universe where it kind of speedruns through its origin in order to get to those titular scenes that the fans love so much, making it not actually that great for newbies. But while it is a complete film, I find it a very underwhelming one that ultimately just has a handful of good scenes, making it a YouTube clip movie. Because while the scenes with Ladybug and Cat Noir, meeting for the first time, singing together and developing chemistry is some of their best moments in the entire franchise, as well as other moments that only exist in this movie, as the show has made them canonically impossible, however, Marinette and Adrian as characters are shadows of their former selves, as we really just don't have the time to be able to delve into what drew fans to them especially Marinette, who is essentially not herself at all, just a generic shy new girl, with three different songs all about the same topic of believing in herself. Though I can guess for some, this might be a version of Marinette that they prefer. I found her just very boring. Can you really say that this is Ladybug if the civilian part of the love square feels like an obligated afterthought? I feel like the phrase high budget fan film but in a good way has been said at some point, but personally, I preferred the Ladybug and Cat Noir, but if they were villains special. That should not have hit as hard as it did. New Gods Young Jian is sequel to New Gods Neja, the new name for Neja Reborn as they are apparently turning this into a franchise. I've heard that before. While much less popular, Young Jian is also a character who appears in both Investiture of the Gods and Journey to the West as someone who is even stronger than the Monkey King for a time. But his biggest narrative role is probably in a separate story called The Lotus Lantern, which has been adapted several times, including an animated movie in 99 where Yang Jian is actually the antagonist who trapped his sister under a mountain for having a child with a mortal, where his nephew is the protagonist trying to save her by cracking open a mountain. Which is a little weird, considering I believe, through my admittedly very limited research, that Yang Jian's own origins are basically the same. That his own mother was trapped under a mountain for marrying a mortal, and him needing to crack open a mountain to save her. So it seems like half the purpose of this film is reconciling that fact by having there be a reason for this repetition in the family lineage, as here Young Jian and his nephew are co-protagonists. And that makes sense given that it seems to be the new god's mission statement to reevaluate these classic myths. Unfortunately, the fact that I felt I needed to do this research is because the beginning is kind of hard to follow. Also because I'm still a dumb American about this stuff, but Jung at the beginning of this film is still a god, 
So he's surrounded by these hundreds of gods, demons, and other mythological references I don't know. A problem that Najah had significantly less of because his movie started out in the human world, where his enemies, the water dragons, were now water hoarding mobsters. That I could understand! But once we establish the more personal stakes and the connection between the two, it does become a lot more engaging. And like other Light Chaser movies, this is a gorgeous, gorgeous film. Still, in comparison to this, Netflix's Monkey King is certainly a lot more of an American accessible story, and that's swinging the pendulum to the entire other side. Monkey King is exactly what you would think a westernized CGI animated film based on the Monkey King would look like. I offer my skills as your humble assistant. Hard pass. Supposed to be lightning fresh. And there it is. And overindulging on the unlikable jerky protagonist. However, even five years ago, I wouldn't think that any American studio would have put in the effort to keep as many details as loyal as possible to the Monkey King's original story. Except, of course, for the child tagalong, because there is always a child tagalong. The film indeed might press some audiences' obnoxious tolerance, but given how low the critical scores were, I was actually vaguely okay with this film and even found a lot of the animation and comedic timing to be pretty decent. But I myself have my own limits with jerk protagonists. It also proved what I already knew, that the Lego Monkey Kid is vastly superior. And because it is already starting off in such a very, very loose adaptation standpoint as a modern interpretation, it allows the flexibility to be loose from not even remotely similar to being impressive when it does get things right. And Monkey Kid does what the Monkey King movie doesn't even try to do, pronounce Chinese names correctly. <laughs> But the cat came back the very next day. The cat came back, they thought he was a god. But the cat came back, he just couldn't stay away. The Amazing Maurice is an adaptation of Terry Pratchett's Amazing Maurice and his educated rodents that I believe is part of the Discworld series. A twist on the Pied Piper fairy tale as Maurice uses his fellow intelligent rats and human companion to pull off a Pied Piper pest control scheme. But the rats keep pushing back against the scheme as not being very ethical until there's suddenly a sinister threat against them. Overall, Maurice appears to be a decent adaptation of its plot points and even characters, but there's adapting the plot and adapting the tone. It does manage to keep a decent amount of the story's darkness, but it does become ingrained in typical animated movie shenanigans that make it a bit more silly when the original prose had Terry Pratchett's classic wit. But the biggest thing that irked me was Militia, who is akin to her book counterpart in the way that she's obsessed with stories, but this likely wasn't quite as exhausted when this was written in 2001, but in a zeitgeist where we have been beating the meta horse to death, I started wincing every time she said, this is the part of the story where, and then I straight burst out laughing when she was bitch slapped into a tree. But however mid the middle was, the ending of the movie absolutely stuck the landing by bringing in Disworld's death, by far one of the most endearing fictional characters in the history of anything. So overall, it's fine, but it's also why I'm pretty sure we don't get a lot of Discworld adaptations. Many people would rather that they not bother than risk taking away the magic. A dream that you loved me and I held your hand in mine. They concluded at that moment after much deliberation. There, you got your nomination. Now will all you Mario Sims finally shut the hell up? Honestly, the Mario movie discourse itself was enough to never want to talk about this movie ever again. But putting unnecessary film filleting and judgment aside, this has been a continuation of me actually enjoying Illumination movies. Though it is still very Illumination in its narrative. The one criticism I do think critics were unnecessarily hard on, aside from the easter eggs automatically being a bad thing, was that Mario himself didn't have an arc. Lots of protagonists don't have arcs. Internal struggles may be very relatable and the critically acclaimed thing to do, but for basic adventure stories, a good external struggle is all you need. However, they did deliberately set up a potential arc for Luigi to become more courageous, so it's sad that they didn't do anything with that, and as many have stated, wish that the Mario Brothers movie could have spent more time with the Mario Brothers together. Also, the needle drops, which I don't really get. You had a video game soundtrack right freaking there. 
but otherwise was definitely did better than nearly all of its other video game movie predecessors at feeling like a loyal and suitable adaptation. The animation is Illumination's usual great visual work, and I'm so glad this was animated and not live action. The Mushroom Kingdom looked great, Toad was also there, Peach was also there and overcame Illumination's notorious dumbass damsel third act problem. DK is the first time I've ever really enjoyed that character, and the implementation of the video game powers into the battle mechanics were really fun to watch come alive. And of course, Jack Black as Bowser and his Peach's song were a revelation, instantly becoming an iconic moment in animation history. But still important to remember that a big reason why this succeeded was because Nintendo was holding the leash. Still, I hesitate for Illumination to take on any other Nintendo's properties, especially Legend of Zelda, but we'll cross that bridge when we get there. Now that moment forever ago Is home to more than one regret A reoccurring sad vignette we might be sick of multiverse and alternate timelines in its typical form, but I haven't seen anything quite like this, even if its gimmick is a tad stronger than its story. This is a connected two movies where each story is a diverted path based on the outcome of a pivotal choice made by the protagonist, whether to go with his mother or his father after their divorce, eventually falling for two different women, but then converge at the end. This is set in a world where the existence of alternate timelines is not only widely accepted, but the knowledge of occasional random slippage between timeline is apparently common practice, and the protagonist will eventually follow his father's footsteps in studying this phenomenon. I was intrigued by the idea that these two movies would be side by side rather than a mere part one and part two, as I initially couldn't see the cue of which one you needed to watch first, which may have been the intent, but it became clear that you were indeed supposed to start with one and follow up with the other, as one had a more complete, gradual, expositioned intro and the other a proper conclusion. While it's not incomprehensible if you watch them inversely, you should definitely start with To Me, The One That Loved You, the one with the girl with the long hair, and follow it up with To Every You I've Loved Before, which is confusing given how these posters line up, and then you remember that Japan does vertical right to left, so never mind. Maybe it is the first impression, but I did genuinely like the second one more, as it technically did more with the concept of slippage, where the first one felt more like a lot of technical setup, while the protagonist just spent most of his time moping. Plus, look at these two, doing science in their underwear. That's relationship goals if I've ever seen it. This is one of those sci-fi stories that's very dialogue heavy with a lot of technical sci-fi jargon, which kind of by extension also means that the animation is largely stationary and not exactly top tier. This isn't a must watch, but it is kind of a unique creation. However, if you want a more proper sci-fi fantasy romance with less technical jargon and certainly one that's better animated, The Tunnel at the End of Summer is about two teenagers who find a tunnel in the woods where time moves significantly slowly. As in an accidental trip into the tunnel for a second and you've lost an hour in the real world. So yes, it is a reverse hyperbolic time chamber. Mostly the two bond as they futz around with how the tunnel works, eventually exchanging their personal dreams and demons. The simpler story is certainly prettier and more digestible, but I still find the pair of timeline movies to at least be something interesting. But I guess since we're speaking about mid-anime romances with sci-fi, I might as well throw in Maboroshi, even though in placement I would definitely put it somewhere around Urkel, which is a shame considering that this is another Mari Okuda film. Does look nice, but to emphasize its core problem, it would take me way too long just to convey what this movie was about, so I will just say, when it comes to convoluted lore around time manipulations of pocket dimensions that are semi-metaphors for what it's like to live in a small town in existential dread, we have Higurashi at home. Also, this is the most hilarious melodramatic out-of-nowhere love confession between two characters that I absolutely do not care about. Yeah, 
Man, remember when we were reacting to the original Trolls movie like it was the end of cinematic animation? And that was what, seven animation destroying films ago? I have described Trolls movies before as feature-length dance parties, and that is definitely still true. Narratively, I think that the second one is best in concept with the idea of the different musical genres clashing, but while I find most of Trolls 3 to be pretty forgettable, it pulls ahead at least of the original film for me with three things. That it has an actual finale. Both of the first two Troll films have the exact same finale. I am just glad that this one does something different, even if it is both chaotic and still pretty much just as cheesy. Also, I'm not 100% sure, but I think that those villains are based off 90s toys that actually existed. I seem to remember a certain amount of dolls that were famous for having those kind of spindly, posable limbs. Betty Spaghetti? Huh, I guess I did need to be reminded that this was technically a toy commercial. A lot of the reason why I dislike when mainstream music utilizes pop songs is you just basically take a file and plug it into the background soundtrack. It just feels lazy. They amped it up a little bit with mashups, and I admit, I'm a sucker for mashups. And then, yes, there's all of the boy band jokes. They are surface level, they are cringy. We're not in sync. We've gone from boys to men, and now there's only one direction for us to go. The back streets. They are dad jokes, and that is exactly what they are meant to be. It still has its creative utilization of animation by integrating craft-like textures, this time implementing a bunch of puppet-like characters, which is absolutely bizarre and kind of funny. And hey, at least there, there was a drug trippy sequence where they allowed for some 2D animation. I do think the hype around this film was more driven by being anti-Disney than this being amazing, but at least it was fun. I How the hell was this not called Batman vs. Cthulhu, the easiest, baitiest title of all time? Unless it was taken, or Cthulhu is still too niche, or copyrighted? Of course, the conundrum with anything Lovecraft is that his horrors are often described as too horrifying to explain, which makes it hard for visual adaptations to hold up. Not impossible, but that is the case for this very bright art style, where the original comic this was based on is vastly superior. But that has become the kind of standard reception for direct comic adaptations in animated DC. The film's art isn't bad, it's just that it's too generic so it lessens the impact. Also, uh, Talia and Roz are looking a bit more like racial stereotypes than they usually do. But again, Lovecraft. Still, there are some cool designs, and leaving a decent amount of it still in the shadows. And even with the story dragging its feet a little at the start, I did enjoy this Lovecraftian take on classic Batman characters. And this tragic cosmic horror mystery premise. It did get the madness part, including that I liked the ending, which has not been a consistent opinion. Still, I am definitely confident that the graphic novel is better. Otherwise, for other DC animated features this year, people have not been a fan of the Tomorrow vs. Justice League War World, which puts the main three in their own individual genre short films. As cool as that sounds, and it sort of is, it's like we just get a hang of being in one world before we instantly move on from it. And then by the end, it was all just a setup for Crisis on Infinite Earths. It's rough, but I don't dislike it as much as others do. And finally, there was the Justice League x Ruby duology. Unfortunately, maybe the last thing released by Rooster Teeth before it was shut down this year. I have been up and down on Ruby through the years, but I was a big fan of Red vs. Blue, especially the chorus arc, of which we are going to get the final season this May. So the shutdown was sad to hear, even if it was an almost hilariously unshocking move from Warner Brothers. The fate of the Ruby series and the various IP under them is unknown at the moment, but in the meantime, rest in peace, cockbite. I have been waiting for this one. I mentioned I Am What I Am in 21, but it hadn't been released yet, and it's still hard to find now. But there is no more straightforward way to sell this movie other than 80s sports movie and apply it to lion dancing. It has everything. Scruffy underdogs, elite sponsored rivals, a used to be champion coach that drinks way too much, upbeat montage, and an absolutely stellar climax. Though maybe lion dancing isn't the correct description, but it appears to be a 
sport or dance where you do an obstacle course or at least balancing with the lion costume on with at least two people usually connected. It was incredibly fascinating to watch. And as I said then, the movie had a little bit of controversy when it came out regarding whether its eyes were offensive, but if anything, some people just said that they looked bad. But critically, the movie went over really well, especially for being one of the very, very few Chinese animated films that is not based on any mythology or fantasy in any way. Still managed a Monkey King reference. You ruined everything, you stupid, stupid bitch. You're just a lying little bitch who ruins things and wants the world to burn. So Barbie was far from the only movie that would talk about the various conflictions of being a woman. I will tell you that my favorite live action movie of the year was Poor Things, but among these were two lesser known animated films, My Love Affair with Marriage and The Peasants, coincidentally both taking place in Eastern Europe. My Love Affair with Marriage is conveyed as an autobiography of Zelma, as we see her development as a woman from the physical to the emotional to the social over the course of her life, including the men that she loved, the various lessons and instructions and implications in terms of what makes her a good woman and how it affected her behavior, and the honest mental processes she went through during the various milestones and core memories. Of course, including her marriage. The animation may be rough, but it's a combination of absurdist 2D art with real crafted backgrounds, and despite how limited it is, it's expressed with a lot of humor and visual flair. After she goes through a particular story of an event in her life, it'll go through the physical developments in terms of what hormones are defecting the development of her brain and her body. And while I couldn't relate to everything that she went through, there were several moments that spoke very directly to me. The Peasants is by the same directors as Loving Vincent, but where that movie was a mystery of the last day of the artist's life while emulating his style, The Peasants is adapting a famous novel from what I hear is school standard in many places in the area, and not emulating any specific artist, but an amalgamation of several Eastern European artists and famous works. So it doesn't feel like it's quite taking advantage of the medium as much as it could, as the peasants often feels like it's just oil painting over the live actors. Though it does have some nice transitions between the geography and time. The film surrounds Yagna, a beautiful girl from a small farming village, who starts the movie caught between her affections for a married man and freedom, and being arranged to be married to his wealthy father. And that is just the start of her problems. As beautifully made as this film is, this is appropriately part of a letterbox list called Hopeless Cinema because you are just watching this girl's life be destroyed. Who between being an object of desire and frustration for the men and an object of gossip, judgment, and resentment for the women, eventually she becomes a tension outlet for general frustration with everything wrong going on in their lives from political to starvation. There is a lot that this story conveys about the human condition and obviously specifically toward beautiful women to the point where it could basically be called Twitter in the 1900s. And exactly how that sounds, it is rough to watch. It is frequently beautiful and impressive, but it is also a massive bummer. So yeah, between the two, My Love Affair with Marriage is by far the more pleasant experience. Especially because that movie really does feel like it's one artist's vision. really loved the first Chicken Run. It's probably my favorite stop motion after Coraline. Which is not to say that I was dying for a sequel, but I'll certainly take one. But then I'd take anything that Ardman made. After the first movie and the chickens reside on their island solar punk paradise, Rocky and Ginger's daughter, in classic teenage fashion, doesn't like being cooped up for no reason, so runs off and gets pulled into the most inefficient chicken factory ever. So now, instead of a break out, it's a break in to save her. This definitely doesn't quite hit the same because the original really nailed having a sense of dread and desperation, and it could actually be quite dark. Whereas the sequel is definitely more upbeat, and it is funny, and I still had a lot of fun with it, it just didn't leave the same impact. Also, Rocky really doesn't need to be there, which is a giant shame because he and Ginger actually started out as a pretty cute and balanced couple. And for as much as it may be initially baffling and obviously wrong-headed for Ginger to not give her daughter a reason why they can't leave the island, which of course inevitably backfires, like every other overprotected parent stories, but this time I like how it connects to the grander scope. 
Ginger and the others locking themselves away in their paradise while the rest of their kind is still being processed in farms and factories. So in an ideal way, I do like how this one ends, even if it's not very practical. And I can only imagine what my reaction to the re-emergence of Mrs. Tweety would have been given the slow, dramatic build-up if it hadn't been revealed in the trailer! Now I'm imagining a series of movies where each time she dies horribly, but somehow returns the next time with a new husband and a new chicken confection. It's a heist movie. It's a fun heist movie. It's a really well done fun heist movie. But that's also kind of it. Cause I'm more, more than the meathead. I'm on more than the club every weekend. After the release of its trailer, and a very small theatrical one, Paramount's Under the Boardwalk went straight to digital with virtually no notice or acknowledgement. So for about a month, it felt like I was the only one who knew that this film existed. And while many did and do condemn the words of the Paramount president over his words regarding original theatrical animation, if you look at it only through the prism of Paramount, because pretty much since Rango, they have had no luck when it came to original animation. Only the stuff they've made based on IPs has been both financially and critically successful. I do sympathize with the conundrum of how exactly do you advertise the Hermit Crab musical, but I guess we'll never know now! So between this variety of weird factors, I found myself having a weird personal connection to it. So yeah, this is basically my Wish Dragon of the Year, which people still give me an unnecessary amount of crap for. In execution, Under the Boardwalk kind of reminds me of Cars. Not remotely original, not the best in any individual area, but a very solid and enjoyable delivery of the insane premise that it is. Though maybe more specific to compare it to Smallfoot. I don't know if there'll be any pushback to the use of New Jersey or Italian-American stereotypes, which there are certainly enough of, but generally most of these characters come off as well-meaning and wholesome. And yes, beforehand I shrugged about whether or not this was better than Wish's soundtrack, but undeniably it is. While a few of its songs are pop songs to a T, and honestly even better pop songs, these songwriters definitely understood musical storytelling and musical theater tradition much better, especially in regards to its opening number. For two songs that are titled Welcome to Location of Film, Welcome to New Jersey does an infinitely better job at introducing the personality of the location with lyrical prowess and humor, and introducing the conflict of the film in the tension between the land crab locals versus the sea crab tourists. Honestly, for a B-grade animated film, I think that is a fantastic concept. I love the way that it implemented trash into their world building, and it is clever how it took the concept of exchangeable shells and turned them into not only accessories of personal expression, but also as metaphors for community and growing up. I really wish this movie had been given a bigger shot, but at least it was released. Some haven't been nearly as lucky. To be ashamed of all my scars Run away, they say No one will love you as you are in a landscape where most family CGI movies look the same, Scary Girl's visual style popped out to me instantly, like a more colorful alien version of Tim Burton. If anyone's been to Meow Wolf's Convergence Station, which is basically like walking through a various alien worlds that look like someone took our world and pressed randomizer, but in a fantastically appealing way, Scary Girl's world is basically that, but if it was mixed with Hello Kitty, about a girl with a tentacle, an eye patch, and a hook hand who goes on a mission to find her talking octopus father. Okay, so this sounds like the best thing ever. I really wish the movie had lived up to those expectations. This was actually based on a Square Enix game from 2012, which explains somewhat of the exploratory nature of its plot, but in a way that makes it feel like it's really taking its time to go to each location, where if it was somewhat tighter paced, possibly could see more locations of this fascinating world. And it is so evident that they wanted this to be stop motion, but that's expensive, so instead we got CGI emulating stop motion, to some disappointment, but is generally good. Most of what drags it down for me is just some of the side characters feel distracting and not that helpful. Maybe they were in the game so they had to be there. And the plot is pretty simplistic. But then the relationship that she has with her octopus dad is like legitimately great and I kind of love them. I admit that the end result doesn't quite live up to the hype that I may have alluded here, but still, out of most of the movies this year, I do kind of have a special emotional connection to this one. 
Jingle bells, Batman smelt, Robin laid an egg. The Batmobile lost the wheel, and the Joker got away. I really am glad to see every once in a while Batman going back to his campy, somewhat child-friendly roots. And this time they did it by turning him into basically every suburban dad, and Damien into the average child that gets particularly fixated on a particular toy, but this case for a very specific reason. Directed by Mike Roth of Regular Show, the story mostly follows Damien, who just really wants to be a superhero like his dad and be taken seriously by him, so after an attempted burglary, gets into shenanigans with several classic Batman villains. Father Matthew of Always Sunny does a pretty good Joker, and yes, by nature, Damien is less of what I usually call him, though this is still a Damien makes everything worse story, but at least it's mostly aware of it this time. My favorite is still the one from Harley Quinn, right on that level of being an annoying little shit, but still kind of cute. No, actually, still the one from Super Sons. I mostly really enjoyed this special, but initially I particularly liked how it handled the theme of kids wanting to grow up so fast and what it truly meant to be a grown up and what it meant to be mature and what it meant to be a superhero. And then the ending kind of undid most of that because it still needed to be child wish fulfillment, I guess. But out of the surprising number of new Christmas animations on my list this year, this one was easily the best one. Let me do this one thing, or at least die trying. trying. I'm gonna do this one thing, or at least die trying. Yes, even if it was Illumination, I was looking forward to the movie with Ernest and Celestine's director. And not all that surprisingly, it is currently my favorite out of their lineup. It may not seem all that different from something like Secret Life of Pets. Heck, if anything, the story is actually less substantial and really more like three sequential incidents that the Duck family has to overcome on their migration until the movie just kind of ends. But the comedy is solid. The animation is as good as it ever is. Glad that people are seeing the value of the 2D eyes. And particularly way more than a lot of other Illumination movies, I found the family very likable, but also devoid of a lot of Illumination's usual gimmicks. The dialogue felt way more natural, and I don't think I heard a single pop song in the entire movie. Wait, they did have a salsa swing cover of Survivor, but it was diegetic. And I'm good with covers in different genres. And yet, weirdly, the early take was to claim that this movie was a flop. It has stayed in the top five for two months. Sure, it may be starting a little behind a lot of the other ones, but that still shows more growth and risk-taking than many of the other movies made this year. Kind of like the Parallel Universe movies, it is evident that Lonely Castle in the Mirror is based off a novel, with its story having giant leap forwards in time, scenes that feel like they're meant to be longer, and the storytelling is 85% conveyed through dialogue. And as such, its animation is not top tier. However, I have found myself substantially more emotionally connected to this story than many of the others this year, as many potentially will given the very relatable subject matter of adolescent social anxiety and obstacles including bullying and abuse. The story consists of seven children who suddenly find that their mirrors have become portals to a magical castle where they are greeted by a girl in a wolf mask who tells them that they may spend as much time as they want here over the next year, where if they manage to find a key, one of them will be given a wish, but every one of the kids will lose their memories of their time in the castle, whereas if none of them make a wish, they will all keep their memories. And the movie is basically just how these kids spend their time getting to know each other and talking about their lives. Getting closer to each other while intermittently reminding themselves of, oh yeah, there's this key we're supposed to be looking for. Just in the concept of cozy fantasy, the idea of a dimensional castle, which is literally your own escape from the real world and a private group of friends is just so appealing. It's like how we want internet socialization to be. I also have an affinity for stories that either are homages or use motifs of very specific fairy tales, and Lonely Castle utilizes the lesser known Seven Billy Goats. Anyway, while its storytelling is a bit scattered and its ending comes off as a little hokey, as a lesser known anime movie, I greatly enjoyed Lonely Castle, even if I'm sure that the book it's based on is probably better. Who cares what it looks like, baby? It's more important that it cooks right, baby. So like the sloppy supper love can be. 
2023 is the year of hilarious failures, but also comebacks of series who we thought deserved it. I mean, you could technically count Puss in Boots' Last Wish as a 2023 success, while not the modern classic that Puss in Boots is, and not even Pixar at its best. While I am the queen of if this wasn't made by Pixar, audiences would have loved it, which is still true. I mean, again, I swear that people would adore this movie if it was made by DreamWorks. But I think in Elemental's case, I think it would have actually been a little bit harder for looking like such a blatant Pixar ripoff. At first, even I wasn't sure if the characters being fluid would have been too hard to watch for an hour and a half. But it actually proved itself to be a very cute and beautifully animated cross-cultural romantic comedy. By far not an incredibly original one, but hit the audience harder because of the immigrant-coded family fidelity element. That was not conveyed at all in the trailer. Elemental premiered in the middle of box office Apocalypse June, where Spider-Verse ultimately destroyed everyone around it. And though its box office comeback is maybe a little exaggerated, though it did make more than Lightyear, I was at least glad for that. But the real success story is that Elemental became the number one streamed movie across any platform this year. Though that is somewhat dependent on which list you're looking at, because it's either above or below Moana. And yes, that's why it's suddenly getting the star theatrical treatment, because it's eight years old and it is still that popular. I guess people had finally gotten their fill of Frozen. Though it's also true that if Mario had been released to Netflix from the get-go instead of to Peacock, then it easily would have outdone both of them. Still, it is significant that Elemental's resurgence was due to a lot of the elements that people thought it wouldn't work. That it was an original story, that it was a romantic comedy, which we haven't seen in theaters very often, and concluded that the common denominator in most of the things that were decent hits this year was that they weren't superhero movies, mostly. Hollywood's oversaturation has indeed eaten itself, and hopefully Pixar takes the right lesson and invests again in original stories for theaters. I love the first Ernest and Celestine. It is an absolutely charming and beautiful story about a bear and mouse becoming friends because they don't fit in with their own kind. In Ernest and Celestine 2, now having a different director, Ernest returns to his hometown to find that music has been outlawed in a very surreal way. And I like Ernest's struggle to figure out how to deal with his strained family relationships, but not enough for me to ignore that Celestine basically doesn't need to be in this film because the bear versus mice thing just suddenly doesn't exist. I guess they were the Queen Charlotte of their universe. Still, the city's absurdist laws as satire for the dumb emotional whims of their leaders and the consequences they have on everyone around them is amusing in and of itself. Even if for older audiences, it just inevitably makes you think, I wish it was that easy to undo all this damage and mistrust. I still adore this artwork and all of the characters are super adorable. It's just hard to live up to a classic. It took you all way too long to try another animated theatrical TMNT movie. I hope you've learned your lesson and stay there this time. Really cannot be understated that the Ninja Turtles was one of the most beautiful and original looking movies of the entire year, from the scribble inspired designs, the highlighter colors, and how fluid and impactful that action was. And yet was maybe the TMNT movie with the least action which left more room for character, which has been what I've always been rooting for. However, on that front, this movie did underperform just a tad. Because while it was shockingly inspired to get teenagers to play teenagers, this is the version with maybe the least clear distinction between the four brothers. It is a genuinely great concept that the four have a unified goal that has nothing to do with beating up a villain. But it's not enough to say that Mikey likes comedy or that Raf is the angry one when in actions he's only just slightly more overexcited and impulsive than the others. And go back and watch Sean Astin. He had this down from the start. Generally, I'm still pretty happy with it, and if nothing else, the no diggity scene will certainly go down as one of the best TMNT moments in all of history. But then I saw the animation for this movie's spin-off series, 
Apparently also going for the feeling if like kids drew it. I guess we're going for 2000s era Newgrounds MS Paint. So now until proven otherwise, I shall constantly be uttering we gave up rise for this under my breath for the remainder of time. underestimate how much millennials salivate over anything with Adam Sandler's name on it. His record in animation, at least with me, has not been high, even if he himself usually gives a good performance. Leo, however, has become a recent Netflix darling, and this time I get why. Sandler stars as a 74-year-old class lizard alongside a turtle played by Bill Burr, who have been watching elementary school classes so long that they've recognized patterns in children's behavior as well as school practices. But when Leo starts to feel his mortality, he starts giving them advice on their various school and social woes. I'm especially impressed at how well they handled the child characters and even the parents. I was worried giving the entire premise of an old man gives advice to the youths that it would ultimately be about him complaining about modern times and the new generation. In fact, his advice is less about kids these days and more about actually saying how through the years kids have always been the same. Treating the child characters with respect and all of the different personalities, I am genuinely impressed. And this is also really funny. It actually is a compliment to say that the drone is the funniest character. Sandler and Burr especially have some great exchanges, even the jokes they make about the kids, like guessing who they'll be in 10 years based on their personality and behavior. Teachers and parents make these jokes all the time. And I keep forgetting, but this is also a musical, but it doesn't necessarily stand out as one because the songs are very short. They're not Broadway, but they're silly little child jingles, like from Bob's Burgers, and I think that that is great. This is maybe my favorite thing that Adam Sandler has ever done. Despite having ended its manga and anime in 1996, Slam Dunk is one of the most beloved and best-selling manga of all time. And if not regarded as the best sports anime, then likely in the top three. And nothing probably conveys just how loved it is than the fact that the first Slam Dunk made more money in the Japanese box office than Godzilla Minus One, Boy in the Heron, and Mario Brothers. Like, just over Mario Brothers, but still. The first Slam Dunk is a movie that takes place completely over the course of one game, already in session by the start, while intermediately flashing back to significant moments for each player. I know nothing about Slam Dunk, but I do think it gave a great, if brief, insight into each of the core cast and their dynamics in history to feel emotionally connected to what they were going through, and the way the movie's pacing and regulation of the tension and adrenaline with just how great this animation looks, to the point that it looks rotoscoped, made this an incredibly suspenseful watch even for somebody who isn't big on sports. And that does seem to be the trend that this movie is most well-liked by audiences who don't know Slam Dunk, whereas for fans, it's a little bit more mixed. Because if I'm getting this right, this movie is of the final game from the manga, a game that did not make it into the 90s anime. Okay, so this is the Jungle movie. It's the official finale that took way too long to get here. Except that while it does give each of the core cast their moments, the film's narrative in most of the flashbacks are around a character who is not the main character from the series. I guess because this one had the more tragic backstory to make the movie more emotional? And as good as it looked, one review said that the realistic look made it feel like it took the anime out of anime, which would be true for the more exaggerated Kurokono basket, but I think is probably appropriate for the more grounded slam dunk. Nonetheless, it is clear that a lot of love and effort went into this movie, and that seems to have been mostly reciprocated. And I know that every great sports game comes down to the wire, but I have not seen a game come this far down to the wire. Then there's Blue Giant, based on a more recent popular manga, 
about Dai Miyamoto who wants to become the best jazz musician in the world. And the movie is his first professional step on that journey by creating a band with an experienced haughty jazz pianist and a former classmate complete novice drummer. And music manga adaptations always have that intimidation that they actually have to write the music that creates such awe-inspiring reactions on paper. Which is why the written story often has to be so character-based since readers can't rely on the music to carry it. So the character dynamics are already well formed and that's absolutely where the heart is, seeing the evolution of the bond between these characters. But this music puts up. And it is paired with such mind-blowing visuals that Food Wars is jealous. The CGI is not quite as good as Slam Dunks, but they make up for it with some full-on trigger moments. Both of these movies were absolutely exceptional entries from Japan, some of the best that many won't hear about. Though Blue Giant, I think in the next month, is going to be playing in a couple theaters. Little Nicholas is a French comic mostly just of an average boy doing average boy things, dealing with school, friends, thinking girls are icky. However, this film is also about its creators. It opens with them coming up with the premise of Little Nicholas, both having a conversation with the meta-illusion of Nicholas, explaining some of the reasons why he was created the way that he was. And a big reason was not just how both creators greatly admired Paris, so that's where they set his upbringing, but also because they both had very rough childhoods. So they basically wrote their own idealized Parisian childhood. I absolutely love this retro comic style. It is absolutely filled to the brim with charm, and it is absolutely heartbreaking to hear the creators talk about the embodiment of their creation. Love is an open door. Love is an open Suzume is the third in Makoto Shinkai's Supernatural Disaster of Japan series. This time around, it's earthquakes that spawn from abandoned structures of Japan's past, so it actually might be more appropriate to call them man-made disasters. And each time, Shinkai has broadened his scope, as Suzume and a human that turned into a chair, which is not crazy, in Japanese mythology inanimate objects turn into demons and humans all the time, have to travel the length of Japan from southern Kyushu to northern Hokkaido, and along the way stop and are helped by various walks of Japanese life. So it feels like it's truly bringing together Japan as a whole, as well as tying its past into its present. All of these are individual elements that I love about the film, especially just watching the chair move with so much speed and determination. However, I fail to really connect with this film. I don't get much out of Suzume herself, even as she has her own past and present to confront. I don't gel with stories where it feels like it's pushing the audience to read its main couple as romantic when it absolutely does not need to. It somehow both over-explains and under-explains how the whole supernatural earthquake worm thing works. But most of all, this cat, which is adorable, but fuck this cat. Because by the end, nothing has really been resolved. We reset to zero, at least by my understanding, and nothing is stopping this cat from doing what it did all over again. I can see the parts that are meant to work together, they're just not quite connecting for me fully. But the story does function well at least as an adventure story, and certainly a beautifully animated one. Yes, the Venture Brothers movie is an Owl House-style condensed final season after being cancelled after 23 years. So no, you cannot watch this movie and understand anything that is going on. But you might be able to see why this show was such a big deal. Venture Brothers was one of those flagship series of Adult Swim premiering in 2000, and it paved the way for a lot of the narratively serialized adult animation going forward. We definitely would not have a Rick and Morty without Venture Brothers. Except that this show isn't really about the Venture Brothers. Well, at least not these Venture Brothers. The show is a world, one of the most detailed and in-depth and characterized about two organizations that turn battles into supervillains and super scientists into a bureaucracy. We fake fight? That's ridiculous. No, we sharpen our claws. It's like fencing. It's, it's about the art of the fight. Yes, the art of the fight, where hundreds of henchmen's lives are completely disposable. And after seven seasons, the movie picks up 
after one of the Venture brothers has gone missing, and after a bombshell was dropped concerning a secret detail on the arch nemesis of their father Rusty Venture. And yes, this will always be Monarch, and this will always be Hawkmoth. And for a season squeezed into a movie, of course I loved it, and also hated that we aren't getting the story in full. It's so clear that there was so much they wanted to do. The creators themselves admitted there was so much more that they wanted to do. It relayed a mystery that would have been fascinating to watch unfold over multiple weeks. That just ends up being expositioned at us. But I am glad to see Mrs. the Monarch and Red Death spending time together with their own subplot. And also, since this is the last time we're here, finally giving Jefferson some screen time. We also end with two more bombshells concerning some of the series' most long-lasting questions. Though the mystery of exactly why the Monarch hates Dr. Venture? Still pretty much unanswered. And always will be. Come on, Venture Brothers Rise of the TMNT, we need to bring these back to life. Hey, love makes you crazy, therefore you can't call her crazy. Cause when you call her crazy, you're just calling her in love. I don't talk about movies based off established anime series, except when I want to. And there is never not enough praise that can be heaped upon Kaguya-sama Love is War. Even if this technically is not a film, but a four-episode follow-up to the bombastic status quo shattering season three. I don't know if you guys knew this, but I can be a hard sell for romances. But while my love story is up there, I don't think there's another romantic comedy, period, that I love as much as Love is War. It starts with an incredibly simple, even potentially repetitive gag premise, of two tsundere's who like each other, who put each other in various comedic and stressful scenarios to try and push the other into confessing their love first. But quickly this series evolves beyond that gag premise, while still indulging amply in it, to then truly fleshing out both of our characters, their histories, the reasons why they like each other, the reasons why they want the other to confess first, on top of all of the personality quirks and love struggles of their fellow classmates many of whom are just as interesting as they are. Season 3 ends with a massive finale-worthy expression of affection, with the other responding in the, I guess, worst and best way they possibly could have, leaving them both in a very awkward conundrum that they have to navigate through in this film, leading up to the official moment where we find whether they will or not finally get together. Also add another one to the technically a Christmas movies. Some people might argue that the feature-length premiere to Hoshino Ko, coincidentally written by the same mangaka, might be more appropriate to cover as it was actually released in theaters. It certainly was one of the biggest events in anime this year. However, since season one didn't actually conclude any major plot points, I don't really see a reason to get started with it until season two comes out only if you want to avoid spoilers. Basically, it's a series about how much it sucks to be an idol, and while skilled at its craft, it doesn't do too much for me personally. Wow, social media is terrible. What a radical discovery you've made. It's more significant and personal to point out the finale to Attack on Titan, as it was also feature length and did manage to avoid the worst of the fallout of the manga's finale by making some amendments. And way more likely that between the finale's action sequences, the score and the performances, managing the tone and providing enough positive stimuli to counterbalance the the controversial nature of its conclusion. I'll only say, guy who did bad thing and said with the words from his face that he would have done bad thing no matter what, was bad and also stupid for doing bad thing. For some reason, that's a hot take. No, but he did it for his friends. He turned their home into a fucking civil war and he did not have to do that. His plan was stupid. Under the sea, under the sea. Darling, it's better, down where it's wetter, take it from me. Talk about a roller coaster. On the one hand, Deep Sea has some of the most ambitious and beautiful animation of the entire year. The ocean's color palette and the integration of Chinese ink wash art into the CG environment in a story about a sad girl when trying to find her mother finds herself at an undersea restaurant, as you do. Definitely some spirited away notes here. On the other hand, I say frequently that I have a hard time when so many things are happening on screen. Well, I give you everything happening all at once on screen, the movie, especially this guy, who truly seems to be conceived to answer the question, can somebody be too animated? And the answer is yes, because he never sits still, which is a bit of an exaggeration. 
but so much of when he's on screen, he is just moving a million miles a minute and constantly contorting his body like he's made of rubber, only unlike Luffy, like he has no default proportions or skeleton to speak of. It's like he's a constantly melting puppet on strings, especially with his lower jaw constantly trying to escape his face. It'd be one thing if it was just him, but there's also hundreds of things moving in the background and the foreground and the camera is always in handheld mode. No one is denying that the detail is commendable. And there is a reason for why he moves the way that he does, but it is exhausting. And this has honestly been a thing ever since I first started looking at Chinese films, which is that somehow there is always something with fluids of various viscosities. And now it's a plot point, so it's everywhere. So no matter how pretty it was, I didn't think that this movie could come back to the brink for me. But then it did the impossible. It took a character who annoyed the crap out of me and it made me almost cry for him. It's not even that this ending was completely unexpected, but I was just taken aback at how well everything ultimately fit together and manages to hit all of the emotional and thematic notes to make a very heavy personal journey. So despite my hangups, this is the best Chinese animated film I have ever seen. None of the others have been able to put me through quite the ringer that this one did. Wow, this one has 13 companies at the front. I think we have a new record. Aside from the strange string of movies this year about birds, 2023 also had a trend of movies with protagonists named Leonardo that are all connected because the turtle is named after Da Vinci and Leo is named after the Ninja Turtle. I thought that was cute. Ooh, he's also referenced in Spider-Verse too. Directed by a Disney veteran and co-writer of Ratatouille, the inventor follows Leonardo da Vinci during the last phase of his life, living in France under Francis I. A time that there's limited information about where he did attempt to design a city that would be France's version of Rome. And also maybe the mechanical lion happened? However, the intent here is not necessarily to be historically accurate, as it's having way too much fun with the animation for that. While it acknowledges the famous figures and events of his life, this is closer to an expression of Leonardo's inspiration and mindset, including his frustrations of wanting to do the work he wants to do while needing to abide by the desires of his short-sighted, ego-driven patron who only wants weapons and statues, but also his fear, especially of death taking him before he's able to finish his work discovering the nature of the soul, all whilst conveying it all in a very animated way through musical numbers and slapstick and cartoons. Right at the start, the Pope is talking about God and heresy and war, and then it shifts into a wacky cartoon that goes from, ooh, war fun, to, oh no, war can be done against us? In one scene, the kings will be getting into bratty toon cloud fisticuffs, and the next, Leo is digging up corpses to study anatomy. Maybe prompting the question, who is this movie for? Well, older kids who want to learn history and cool adults who like animation, that's who. Though I will admit, it is an idealistic glance of the man, and the ending may feel a little lackluster when King Francis just suddenly gets it. Though that finale is gorgeous to look at. And the animation style could not be more perfect, given his scientific and mechanical inclinations, mostly using stop motion, but using parchment drawings for his thoughts, plans, and imagination. This film is a fascinating blend of the mature and the immature, the scientific and the spiritual. This is such a unique and resonating passion project, and I really want to see what Jim Capobianco does next. I really hope I said that right. Being fluffy unicorns dancing on rainbows. Being fluffy unicorns dancing on rainbows. The director of Bird Boy returns for what remains of my soul by taking the most adorable creatures and putting them through the most horrible of endeavors. This time by going back to one of his first concepts in a war story between the teddy bears and the unicorns. But why teddy bears and unicorns? While it's possible that that's what he knew how to draw or for shock value, or the fact that he knew that anyone wants to see unicorns do the obvious thing with their horn in the same way we were all waiting for airbending to be used to suck out somebody's breath. Isn't it because war 
logically destroys everything we consider to be wholesome and innocent? It does touch on the various motivations of war and conflict, from leadership, corruption, and greed to religious zealotry, but its story is mostly just about two brothers, and how they took two completely different paths, influenced, though not defined, from their experiences as children. And this is possibly the most beautifully, disgustingly graphic war film you have ever seen. This movie is looking at Devilman Crybaby and going your move. And yes, I am mutually amused and distracted that the main character's name is Bluey. Spare the sympathy. Everybody wants to be my enemy. We can add this one to the number of Disney L's. Numona is the Goku spaceship after Disney's Frieza destroyed the planet Blue Sky. I don't think I've ever seen a setting of techno medieval, and Numona does get the easy win for the year of her best heroine. As an absolutely wonderful and funny chaos gremlin with some of the best expressions out of the entire year, and using shapeshifting as a way to talk about identity was greatly utilized. Not to mention the shapeshifting itself was fantastically animated. Like a lot of films this year, the third act does tend to fall just a little bit short of being properly satisfying, and in that way I do prefer the comic and also think Ballister was done a little bit better there. But I absolutely love the two of them working together, and I do generally appreciate risking going in a different direction direction than just doing the story that we're already familiar with. And no affront to Blue Sky, who I largely didn't care for when they were here, but that does not mean that they deserve to go out the way that they did. But had Nimona come out under its label, it easily would have been my favorite. Bird fly through my window, little bird, little bird fly through my window, little bird, little bird fly through my window, find molasses can. Well, if my list is going to be late, at least I got one of the most anticipated international nominees that now I don't have to wait until next year to talk about. And I am so glad that it is Robot Dreams. I have been looking forward to this for ages. And it is just as adorable as it looks. But as one of the international independent nominees, it's also not a surprise that it is a bit more melancholy than our mainstream entries. Based on the graphic novel, Robot Dreams takes place in a world of anthropomorphic animals where a dog is lonely so buys a robot companion. Now if you're wondering if this is going to be exploring the social and societal upheaval of a world where fully sentient robots are purchasable, not really. The prominent emotional beats are just regarding the connection between two sentient beings and the life circumstances that unfold that cause it to go in the direction that it does. Which admittedly, uh, would not have unfolded the way they did if uh, one of them had not been a robot. And yes, this is a completely dialogueless film, completely conveyed by its charming visuals and its audio using mostly realistic sound effects, with those scant moments of using mostly diegetic music to great significant narrative effect. Yes, this is definitely one of those films where a not-so-obscure 80s classic is going to make you cry for a completely new set of reasons with a lot of that story taking place within the robot's dreams. Which yes, absolutely will do that thing where it makes you question whether or not what's currently happening is actually happening, or if it's going to suddenly reveal to be a dream. That will happen at least three times, but I am absolutely okay with it. Anyone who's done any study into Miyazaki's work knows just how much of himself and his philosophy he puts into every film. Which is why it's always so fascinating to see how his work and his narratives evolve. And it's ultimately why he keeps not retiring, because he always feels like he has more to say. Especially as he no doubt reflects in his twilight years. So fittingly, Boy and the Heron is the film that feels the most autobiographical covering his childhood, his inspiration, his works, and his legacy. The original title, How Do You Live, was the title of a book that his mother gave to him, and is featured in the movie itself as the protagonist is given it by his late mother. But it is not a direct adaptation of the book, which is supposedly mostly anecdotes and short stories about how young boys should live, but this is his lens of that concept. Now, it's a magical journey of a boy walking through various fantastical small stories and tableaus, all with their various small experiences and messages to help the protagonist at a time where he is emotionally stagnant. And it is this initial stoic nature of the protagonist that I think can make the movie a bit difficult for some audiences. 
When Chihiro fell down her mythological rabbit hole, we relate to her because she responded appropriately with fear and confusion. Where Mahito, Jizuzu Kaisen fans' ears perk up, and maybe not unnecessarily, initially ventures stoically through all these fantastical happenings, which makes it all feel particularly dreamlike. Still, given its more abstract and meditative nature in comparison to his other works, it was a genuine surprise and joy that so many people responded to it, to the point for the first time Miyazaki topped the American box office on statistically the least performing weekend of the entire year, but still. This film is such a personal and unique expression from one of our most beloved artists. He needed to tell it, and we needed to hear Robert Pattinson play a really dumb little bird man. It was always going to be a task to make something, even in the ballpark of the first ballpark, if only to meet half its hype and especially because of how visually groundbreaking it was. But somehow they managed to meet and exceed the expectations in nearly every way finding more ways to experiment visually, more ways to comment on the fan base, certainly up to the number of spider people. But what's particularly emblematic is how this movie does what all of the other superhero blockbusters do, but everywhere else people say they're tired of it. Snarky protagonists, multiverse, Easter eggs, the blend of comedy, drama, and commentary. It's just doing it so much better and artfully and thoughtfully than all of them. Though what did probably impress me the most was how it handled turning Gwen into a co-protagonist. Especially since she wasn't a character I thought much of in the first movie, suddenly became one of the most powerful stories and sequences in this film. Now despite how great and deserved the best animation Oscar would have been, it doesn't surprise me that it went to Boy and the Heron. Besides being completely worthy of its merit, between Miyazaki's last two movies not getting the award, including that his last last film having lost to Frozen, I feel like that alone made the Academy feel like they owed him. And the Academy has done the ignore the middle chapter of a trilogy only to give the finale all of the awards. And I say next time, we aim for the big one. Given the industry's trajectory, it's totally possible. Just, you know, work on your artist treatment. And that goes for everyone. I mean, Ghibli and Miyazaki also aren't exactly known for their laid back approach. But also, yes, it definitely should have gotten a score nomination over Dial of Destiny. So 2023 was honestly a pretty amazing year for animation. 2024 is off to a rough start. And even though I am looking forward to Inside Out 2 and Big Robot, its current lineup doesn't inspire a lot of confidence. However, this has kind of been the pattern for the past couple of years, where animated films will suddenly drop after only a matter of weeks after their trailer does. So there are opportunities for pleasant surprises, but that is honestly less of a concern than the state of the industry. Obviously this year is going to be a little scant because of the strikes and other problems, but that is exactly why, while the industry is reeling, this is an opportunity for independence to really shine. But right now, all we can do is hope for the best and do our best to support our fellow artists. If you want to find your rainbow, then you gotta walk the rain. I don't want to be a hero, I don't do it for the fame. Yeah, you know I'm moving different like I'm glitching at your friends. Cause I don't play this stupid.